So, uh, just uh, a little fun for Tibetan students. means to go, to proceed. You don't want to take what time? You don't want to take what And then the other way of writing this is D. Derbe Tekba and Dirun Derbe Tekba. Uh, they, and dong and dir mean the same thing, go, proceed. So uh, for the prize of the day, uh, who knows what any of the two, what, you know, they mean the same thing, so what they mean. Translate? Deep dong and translate. Translation or wise, or wise it's, it's a beautiful... <laughs> It's a vehicle which proceeds by this, or a vehicle which proceeds towards this? Vehicle which proceeds by this, vehicle which proceeds to this. Certainly looks like that, doesn't it? Any other translation? Well, it could be abposition, the vehicle which is the way of proceeding to by this. OK, that's it, the vehicle which is that by which one goes, and the vehicle which is that to which one goes. Who would have thought? Very good. So same with Didrave Tekvatan, Didrave Tekva. So the uh, genitive is being used as a, a, it's like a gloss genitive, which probably isn't in Joe Wilson's uh, book. <laughs> But he does have apposition. Appositional, yes. Mm -hmm. That's from the old days. <laughs> OK. Um, I, on your papers, I marked uh, quite often your split infinitives, just because especially graduate students are, or anyone who is going to publish something, you may run up against a, an editor sometime who uh, doesn't like split infinitives and will correct them. And you just have to figure out where you want to put the adverb before the split, the infinitive, or after, wherever it sounds better. Sometimes it doesn't sound well at all. Uh, to inherently exist, to exist inherently, I suppose one could say, depending on word order, sometimes it doesn't work. And then you, you do have to split the infinitive. It's one of those old rules that some people keep, some people don't. It can make your material look more acceptable, however. Um, in many of my earlier works, I refer to non-inherent existence, which later I changed to absence of inherent existence, in order to bring across the point that we're talking about a mere negative, a mere absence of inherent existence, whereas non-inherent existence can look like an affirming negative. You're affirming existence, you're denying inherent, the inherent part of it. And I knew that when I chose the first one. It's just I made a bad choice. I very carefully considered it and looked into the Tibetan, and they mean the same thing. So I make, tried to make English mean the same thing as much as possible. Of course, one wants, believe it or not, after looking at my writing, to uh, communicate to readers easily. Um, most of you did not have page numbers on your papers, I presume because you couldn't figure out how to make your computer program uh, put them on it. If you cannot figure that out, then write page numbers on it. Um, I, I just prefer to have page numbers. Uh, it, it, it lets me know where I am in the, pa in the paper as I doze or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Now that can happen. Uh, 
for some reason, I, I like to know well, how much more there is. You <laughs> 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 the last number yeah. first, and then you <laughs> 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 yes, count down to finish. Uh, you, uh, not at all. Uh, you're. <laughs> I have to get out of this somewhere. Your paper topics look most in no, really good. They're very exciting. I never told you that at the time. Uh, they look the most exciting to me. And of course, the, the doing out of them is another matter. <laughs> and if you would please submit to me, along with your paper, a cassette uh, tape. And I will make comments in the cassette tape <laughs> rather than uh, write them on paper. Uh, I can tell you much more. It seems to work, um, right? <coughs> and so, obviously, then put the paper in and then <laughs> with the tape. Lasso. Well, we're rather quickly moving through this topic of the four contracepts. We're on page 182. In the process of going to sleep, or ending a dream, or fainting, or sneezing, or orgasm, or dying. As uh, Nyingma of Lama uh, Kishinsambo said, if you can get a hold of the mind, the clear light, when going to sleep, you can surely do so at the time of dying because it is more, it's faster, it's uh, more difficult to do so. Are there any practices that revolve around well, fainting? Obviously, you can't really control the sleep. <laughs> yes, my, the joke I usually do in public lectures is sneezing. You know, you'd have a cult that <laughs> practices sneezing, so you know, some sort of substance that people <laughs> um, Are there practices for what? Well. You know, we try to control orgasm in highest yoga tantra, and also there's a pr practice uh, simulating death. Um, but there isn't anything really about the process of going to sleep. Yeah, for going to sleep and dreaming, um, people can, in the midst of those states, uh, get a hold of one of these levels of mind. <coughs> For instance, a friend of mine in college, when we first began reading about these things, uh, at night, he, so to speak, woke up in the mind of red uh, increase. And in this state, he was, it was not just the red mind with no phenomena, but all phenomena were appearance of the or orange was for him, orange mind orange like sun and um, he said oh no 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 I was awake well you know he was more awake than he usually was when he was awake and it was in his case just from our having talked about it and um, that stimulated the ability to get a hold of that type of consciousness so people try to do so as they're going to sleep or within, within a dream, or say within a dream, concentrating on the heart chakra and uh, trying to induce the deeper states within, the, within dream. Is there an actual tradition? Yes, there? sleep yoga, dream yoga, yeah, in the six yogas of Naropa. As you descend down to the more subtle levels of consciousness as you go to sleep, and so supposing you're in a deep sleep, you're at the more subtle levels of consciousness, right? Mm -hmm. What if someone woke you up suddenly? Would you instantly wake up and do you instantly go right back to the gross levels? Apparently you go back through them all very quickly. How quickly and is quickly? A couple minutes or instantaneously? No, I think it's instantaneously that 
just, just as fast as it takes for that person to wake you up, <coughs> really. Uh, and so it is apparently when a person dies by accident, or like you're shot, you pass through these states extremely quickly. So you, you have lost it. For a practitioner, it's unfortunate because you've lost an, a really good opportunity for practice because they go so fast. So we talked about the minds of vivid white <coughs> appearance earlier in the semester, right? Orange increase, which is not as if some light is shining in the sky as it was for my friend in this case. Everything was composed of this. Um, as I remember, Ju uh, Mipam Gyatso, the famous Nyingma Lama of this century, um, <coughs> speaks of these minds not only as being, what, supra-phenomenal, in other words, with nothing appearing except this mind, orange mind, say, not only that, but also of appearing, of phenomena appearing within that mind, which my friend's uh, experience uh, confirms. And he wasn't looking at, you know, a very shiny, Palace, Cabo Hall turned into a, you know, a, a palace composed of light. Looking at it, rather everything was like this. Everything was an appearance of this mind. And Mipam also speaks about conceptual thought occurring within these states, but the conceptual thought itself being experienced as the orange mind or the white mind, black mind too. So <laughs> amusingly enough, for the racist, the black is more subtle than the red and the white. <laughs> Deeper. For the white racist, I should have this thrown in their face. Um, which, of course, has no, no bearing on anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm always amused by these things, where, you know, these misidentifications of color or the external form. I remember one day the Dalai Lama was giving a lecture on Madhyamaka and emptiness, and uh, he was looking around the room. <laughs> Look, <laughs> you know, I was just sitting there, and it was just sort of. It wasn't, I'm more derisive than he was, but it was, <laughs> and later he said, you know, all of you think that some of you are big, and some of you are small, and some of you are fat, and some of you are thin. People aren't formed. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> and when he's doing this, you know, people are going. <laughs> One day he looked at a monk who was wearing some brocade. He stopped the process, the, this custom of monks wearing any brocade. And he looked at the person. He made some short comment. And during the piss break, you know, two hours and a half in, three hours in, <laughs> everybody goes outside. And when the guy came back, he had on a regular <laughs> monk's uh, outfit. OK, then the mind of black near attainment. And um, it's um, first part of it, one is still conscious. And then it is so thick, one becomes unconscious, and then all of that is is cleared away. <clears throat> is one even unconscious if one is able to recognize the mind of clear light? Or if you are at the state that you can... Well, what you're supposed to be doing is keep concentrating on the emptiness of inherent existence throughout all of this. Mm -hmm. You don't get overwhelmed with what's going on in order to make it go deeper. And as far as I understand, which is small, uh, <coughs> you, you do become unconscious. Mm -hmm. And why you rise out of that unconsciousness, uh, 
Who knows? I don't know. Yes. Does compassion continue to be an active force even in the state of unconsciousness? Um, in the Gomang tradition, if you ask the question, for instance, in Sutra, with regard to a mind directly realizing emptiness, uh, is a bodhisattva's mind of compassion present? And they posit uh, lo gokyur, which I would, you know, um, we usually translate gokyur as hidden. Um, what's English? Uh, subliminal, which I translate as subliminal. And that means the consciousness is there. And so you can have many consciousnesses there, actually, but it's subliminal. Other systems say it's not, it's not a consciousness. It's only in the form of a predisposition at that point, but it is one that's ready to appear as a consciousness. To myself, the subliminal is quite attractive. That form, that position. Now, with regard to the subtler states of mind, I would suggest that you look in Genin Lotra's Walking Through Walls, look up under something like Mind of Clear Light or Fundamental a Mind of Clear Light, and because I forget what he says. <clears throat> so then on page 183, the point of using orgasm is that one likes it so much that the mind is concentrated strongly on it. Thus, as we've said before, it is not that one is seeking to experience orgasm in a neutral state, sort of like, well, now I'll get over my attachment to this by, you know, it's like you, you like pizza a lot, and so you eat, you stuff yourself with pizza, and you train yourself to do it with a neutral mind. It's not that, right? It's clear. But that's Tripitaka Mala's view, I think. Well, so we have, I'm just reviewing these for the Saturday floor, but perhaps worth saying. Rather, one is intentionally becoming involved in desire in order uh, that, so that the bliss is even stronger, so that the mind is extremely intensely withdrawn, and thus the 64 arts of love and so forth are used. If you'd like to order my book, <laughs> uh, Tibetan Hearts of Love. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Why is that considered not a gross level of the mind, though? I can see how. Um, what? What's the withdraw it? Withdrawn. What's the it the that you're talking about? The oh. Orgasm? Hmm. Okay. Because. Like, why does that not involve the senses, for instance? <laughs> um, when, <laughs> yes, <laughs> the, the body consciousness, the feeling that accompanies the body consciousness is experiencing great pleasure. And the mental consciousness pays attention to that pleasure that's accompanying the body consciousness. And the mental consciousness becomes absorbed in that. And usually, for our experience of orgasm, eventually it becomes quite dumb. Or, and, uh, you know, there's some talk of, uh, I remember there's a fellow on TV who teaches uh, having sex but not having any orgasm, because that's gross. It's just, you know, I mean, it's, who would want that? Uh, and, There are, some people write about dread of orgasm, people disliking the dissolution of the mind into orgasm. Because on the one hand, you have the extremely reasoned mind, and on the other hand, you have this very strong affective feeling state, right? And you can't keep the reasoned state going in the midst of this. And I've written about the possibilities of 
uh, men projecting their uh, being drawn into the state of desire on, on women, for instance. There's a whole lot, there's a huge tradition throughout the world of men dumping on women as being these low affective beings that draw men out of their higher reason state temporarily, be it as it may, but women of are always stuck there anyway, and uh, pro project, you see, the source of desire onto uh, women rather than seeing the continuum of mind as going from this deepest affective feeling uh, withdrawn state to grosser levels, which include reason. Reason actually being grosser. But of course, if the state of orgasm is just a dumb state, then uh, that doesn't make it preferable. But a at least in the, uh, in the system, there is a continuum going from this most subtle mind to the grosser levels of mind, among which this very helpful level of reason is included. Rather than separating the mind into two parts, the affective and the, and the reasonable, which then makes it so easy to project the affective onto someone else. How I was uh, led into reflecting on this was through reading John Boswell who's tracing how, in various cultures, how women have been treated over the ages and the identification of gay men with women. And that, I mean, that's, it's, it's like you're a man who's given up his, his superior birthright to be like this foul thing that draws men beneath their dignity. So anyway, I get, um, I think this um, there are some nice implications about this theory this theory of the nature of the continuum of, of consciousness uh, that militates against separating out the deep affective states and thus of projecting them on other people and, and having them be scum. Yes? I, I'm still um, not understanding why it is a more subtle mind. Is it because it's one-pointed or...? No. Well, for instance, the mind of calm abiding is one-pointed. Uh, the mind directly realizing emptiness in the sutra system. That's unbelievable. I mean, all types of duality have ceased, but that's still coarse compared to these levels. So what exactly makes it subtle? Boy, that's... You just get these questions every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> it's farther down on the list. <laughs> It's not, subtle often means less powerful, this is more powerful. Right. Okay. Jesus is not satisfied with that. Um, Maybe I can rephrase got nothing to say. quality. I understood the question. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm. I mean, the deeper levels of mind are composed of these three strands. The reason why this one is more subtle is that it's beneath the three strands. You already know that, though, all right? You're asking me for something beyond what, what you already know. Yeah, I'm asking yeah. why, what quality makes it beneath the other three strands? Because I was thinking one point in this sort of withdrawal. It's nature. fundamental, it's more fundamental. Just pass on. So, so all you have to do is is really uh, upsetting to read John Boswell's uh, what is it called? Christianity, 
social tolerance and homosexuality. It's just, I, uh, I only got about two-thirds of the way through it. You just start choking about how uh, women have been treated over the ages. Hmm. So, this is used to heighten wisdom. One wants to use this deeper level of consciousness for, for the sake of wisdom, not to become more attached to it. Now, indeed, in the bottom of the page, as the Mongolian scholar Noam Belden says, in the uh, perfection vehicle, how does one achieve a form body? It's through training for a limitless period of time in limitless forms of the uh, perfections. So somebody here thought that the perfection vehicle didn't have a way for achieving the form body it does. But that's criticized by some as not being successful. All right? They have their own way of doing it. And then we've already talked about how whether how whether whether in the three lower tantras no it's how in the three lower tantras one uses desire in the path to hold hands what tantra would that be huh no yoga yoga it's holding hands embracing or embracing Hold hands, and right, there can be a really a great pleasure from holding hands with a person, you know, in this kind of situation. And you, you, and there's only a tradition in Tibet, in Mongolia, that says that consciousness is used to realize emptiness. You can't find it in the text, okay? But it makes sense. Why, why else do it? So the same for performance tantra and action tantra. Now, on the bottom of page 185, these four, wh where do these four types of sexual satisfaction come from. In Vasubandhu's Treasury of Manifest Knowledge, they are associated with various levels of beings in the desire realm. He explains that the gods of the land of the 33, now I, I should have looked this up before coming in today, but I didn't. Uh, we have hell beings. Hungry ghosts, <coughs> animals, humans, demigods, and gods. What are the various types of gods? Form, formless, desire, form, desire formless. Form, form. How many of each are types? Six. Six. There are six gods, types of gods of the desire realm. How many in form? Four. 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 Okay. Now, among the six gods of the desire realm, six types of gods of the desire realm, those in the land of the 33 are one of them. Now, uh, what I should have had for you today was all six, the names of all six. Anybody know them? Well, I, I think you'll have to take from the... The first one is the four <coughs> heavenly kings, and then the 33. 
Chatur Maharajika, and then the 33 cards. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. As you go up, it takes less for the beings to have sexual satisfaction. From the land of the 33 on down, that means including humans, it takes uh, union, sexual union of the, of the organs. In the land without combat, through embracing, that's like yoga tantra. Joyous land, that's your ganden, uh, through holding hands. Did, did I? Yes. And then, above that, the land of liking emanation through laughing. Then above that, the land of controlling emanations. That means others' emanations. Somebody else emanates a being, and then you control that being to do things for you. <laughs> I need my floor washed. <laughs> so you see, The higher you go within the desire realm, the less it takes for satisfaction. Now correspondingly, now this set of four was used by the proponents of highest yoga tantra as a way of looking at all of the tantra sets, right? And of course, if you said that you had to have people of those god realms as trainees of those tantras, it would be sim similarly absurd. And then Fudun cites certain tantras that speak of looking, smiling, holding hands. Tsongva copies them. Okay, then on page 189, the four tantras and the four levels of faculties. That's clear enough, isn't it? Any questions on it? we do have some time to get to the fourth topic, isn't it? Isn't there a, there's nothing left, isn't there, except the fourth topic? The fifth topic? Yeah. Well, you see there was a background, the three types of beings and the three vehicles. Then there was deity yoga. Then there was difference between sutra and tantra. And then there was difference between the four tantras. And now, the clear light a basic religious experience. <laughs> when the Dalai Lama visited here in 1979, Out in Boonesville, where I live, he gave a talk that forms the last chapter of Kindness, Clarity, and Insight. So maybe for the rest of the semester, we can read at least part of this. It's only 20 pages. And um, we can just slowly take a look at it. And What's that chapter called? It's called Union of the Old and New Translation Schools. And it was given at UMA, Boonesville, Virginia. UMA is Union of the Modern and the Ancient. 
Uma is also the Tibetan word for the middle. And the union of the modern and the ancient translates the name of uh, the Tibetan name of the center, which is Sonying Sungu Pling. And he, I keep saying as I've mentioned before, but gave this type of talk uh, many times in India. He gave it to me in his office once, and he gave it to a number of people out at Uma in 1979. I taped the one in his office, which may, no, it was probably before this talk, I don't know. Is it, I don't remember now if it was before this one or after this one. Um, and I taped both of them and then put them together to make this last chapter. So he says, this is more or less a personal account. He's backing off of making any declaration that this is from such and such other person's point of view or from a certain sex point of view but it uh, arises out of his, his own uh, contemplation, his own thought. For a long time, I have had the one-pointed belief that Nyingma, Sankhya, Gagyu, and Gelu are all unions of sutra and mantra, as well as being of the consequence school in terms of the view of emptiness. So r remember, is the consequence school limited to sutra? The view of emptiness that is presented in prasangika is also made use of in mantra, in tantra. So you can't limit prasangika to sutra systems. Therefore, I have had hope and interest in coming to know the various styles of explaining the view, meditation, and behavior in these schools and have made effort in this regard. But generally speaking, the uh, Buddhist view is said these are all middles. The Buddhist view is said to be a middle in the sense that it avoids the extremes of permanence and annihilation, the extremes of reification and of deprecation. The meditation is a middle, is centrist, in that it avoids the extremes of um, laxity and excitement. The behavior is middle or centrist in that it avoids the extremes of excessive asceticism and of indulgence. So he says he's wanted to know these and he's made effort in this regard. And that's well documented. Uh, the many different teachers of various sects uh, with whom he studied. Even though in India there was no talk of old and new systems, in Tibet the presentations of mantra came to be divided into the old and the new translation mantra schools in dependence upon periods of translation of the scriptures. Nyingma is the old. Sakya, Gagyu, and Gelu are included in the new, being those which arose subsequent to the translations of Rinchen Sangbo who lived from 958 to 1055. He lived to be 97 years old. Wow, that's a lot. Somebody living in Tibet. <laughs> you were old if you got to be 50. The newer schools do not differ to any significant degree among themselves with respect to the sutra systems. That's, you know, a mile. Even within Gelug, among the various colleges, 
They try to disagree on everything they can possibly disagree on, okay? So to say that among the various sects, or the new schools, meaning Sakya Gugyu Kilu, they don't differ to any significant degree. He's, you know, he's narrowing down, uh, cutting out what he's going to talk about. But with, with respect to mantra, they differ slightly. <laughs> <laughs> That's very interesting how he puts it, because he's going to show that they all come down to having the same thought. Yes? Do all the different schools say that Kusanga is the highest? Uh, That's what he seems to have thought. Yes, yeah. yes. Jangya, Jangya Roy Doje makes that case in his, and it's, I believe Lopez translated it. Um, and then it will become interesting to see, you know, once that is the thesis, who doesn't fit into the thesis? <laughs> When not investigated in detail, differences in terminology and so forth might lead one to think that there are great differences among the new translation schools about the practice of mantra. However, the basic structure is the same. The Gagyu lineage stems from Thakwa Haje, 1079 to 1153. His lama, Milarepa, and Milarepa's lama, Marba, so Marpa goes back to 1012 to 1096. Marpa's main personal deity was Guya Samaja. You see in, in Gelu, the main system is Guya Samaja, which comes from Marpa. Marpa's main personal deity was Guya Samaja in a, in a lineage translated from Naropa. Similarly, in the Gelu order, Songaba's teaching on the five stages in the stage of completion within highest Yoga Tantra has as its source the teachings of Marpa's transmission of Naropa's quintessential instructions on the Guya Samaja Tantra. So he's, he's linking Geluk to Gagyu. Diminishing differences so that he can talk about old and new, if you... I mean, he's got an agenda, and it's to allow himself to merely concentrate on old and new, which is fine. In addition, many other important topics in both the Gagyu and Geluk schools, such as the Chakra Samvara Tantra, Long Life Achievement, the Hivajra Tantra, and Transference of Consciousness, stem from Marpa. Thus, the basis and overall structure of the Gagyu and Gelu presentations of Tantra are mostly the, st the same. You can sort of hear people's teeth grinding. <laughs> <laughs> Though the clarity and length of explanation <laughs> sometimes differ. <laughs> <laughs> With respect to philosophical view, the translator Marpa explored the view of emptiness under the direction of Maitripada, who in his 10 stanzas on suchness says, non not aspectarians, not non-aspectarians, even Madhyamakas who are not adorned with the guru's speech are only mediocre. Oh, I can't even read that now. I translate it. Notes saying anything? <laughs> I didn't know we we're going to get to this today. Oh well, it, <laughs> he himself explained it. And, uh, I'm in the position of some of my Tibetan teachers who, when I go in to study with them, would say, uh, "You know, <laughs> what's going on here?" And it's just below. It's explained in the very next sentence. <laughs> that they hadn't prepared. <laughs> uh, he says that both true and false aspectarian proponents of mind only do not have the final view, and that even within the middle way school, those who are not adorned with the quintessential instructions of the guru are mediocre. 
In commentary on this, Maitripada's student, Sahaja Vajra, identifies the guru as the glorious Chandrakirti, making it clear that Maitripada considers Chandrakirti's quintessential instructions to be essential if the view is to be supreme. So he's answering your question, at least part. Thus, Maitripada's view, and hence Marpa's, is that of Chandrakirti's middle way consequent school. Furthermore, Marpa's student, Milarepa, in his song to the five long life sisters, says that even though Buddhas, the truth body, grounds, paths, and so forth, even emptiness do not exist ultimately, within the scope of non-analysis and non-investigation, the omniscient Buddha said that everything exists for a conventional consciousness. Thus, Milarepa advocated a non-confusion of dependent arisings in the sphere of conventional truths, as well as the non-findability of even emptiness ultimately. In differentiating the true truths this way, Milarepa set forth the true, unmistaken view of the middle way consequence school. Since the Gelukpa view is also of the middle way consequence school, Gogyu and Geluk do not differ with respect to their philosophical view. Uh, now, of course, Mark Siebold and I are reading uh, the eight Garmova's stinging uh, rejection of Tsongkhapa's <laughs> presentation of uh, Prasangika. But I don't think that's eliminated by the Dalai Lama's point. His point is that both are Prasangika, right? And he's dropping the topic here because he wants to get on. I mean, he could now stop and talk about all the differences between Migyur Doje and Tsongkhapa with respect to Prasanga. But I think the only point he's making here is that both are Prasanga following Chandrakirti. The Sagya school differs slightly in emphasis and in slightly in emphasis and in choice of terminology. But the general structure and systematic development are essentially the same. For instance, Kedru, one of the two chief students of Tsongkhapa, notes in his miscellaneous works that though the modes of explanation of the middle way view by Tsongkhapa and Rendawa, who was Tsongkhapa's Sakya teacher, Tsongkhapa studied with Rendawa, and it's very interesting to read Tsongkhapa's commentary on Chandrakirti next to Rendawa's commentary, next to his teacher's commentary. A lot of differences. Whew. So, Kidrup says, though the modes of explanation of Tsongkhapa and Rendawa differ, they are getting at the same thing. Now, that's different. The mode of expression differs, but not their basic thought. Thus, for the most, now he doesn't go on to explain how this, you know, for this to be done thoroughly, he must explain, he would have to explain what the differences are and then show how they're getting down to the same thought. He is going to do this with regard to highest yoga tantra, and that's what this chapter is on. It's not on prasangika. Thus, for the most part, it is easy to realize that the basic thought of Gagyu, Sakya, and Gelu is the same with respect to the philosophical view in that they are all in that they in that they all are of the middle way consequence school. The school in which it is difficult to see such similarity is the old translation school of Nyingma. In rough term, practices can be divided into those of view, behavior, and meditation. Sometimes it's done view, meditation, behavior. Sometimes view, behavior, meditation. There's no significance. Between this old and new translation schools, there is not much difference concerning behavior and meditation, with small but insignificant variations in the mode of teaching, ranging from rites to the presentation of the path. However, the philosophical views looked at superficially might seem to vary to a greater degree due to the usage of different terminology. That the very roots of Nyingma are valid, 
then you might one might wonder is one or the other valid or invalid that the very roots of Nyingma are valid and accord with reality was recognized even by Tsongkhapa who received teachings on the Nyingma doctrine of the great perfection from the great adept from Hotra Namka Gyansen Tsongkhapa took this Nyingma master as one of his lamas and praised his teaching. Rather than go to India to settle points of the view, Tsongkhapa generated great ascertainment concerning the view through Namka Gyansen. That he did so is clear from Tsongkhapa's biographies. Indeed, prior to the development of the new translation schools, there were a great many scholars and adepts such as the 25 disciples of the precious master Padma Sambhava, among the 25, King Trison uh, Detsen, and so forth, who ascended to the level of adept in their very lifetimes, in dependence only on the Nyingma path. He's you understand what he's trying. The new translation school then has schools had not even formed then. Nowadays also one sees many who show signs, one sees many who show signs of having achieved great spiritual heights through following the Nyingma path. Thus it can be decided that the great perfection or great completeness, Dzogchen of Nyingma, is definitely a pure system of the profound practice of highest yoga mantra. Tsongkhapa's disciple Kedrup, okay? In Kedrup's mis miscellaneous works, a question is raised. I'm just reading today to, to, begin, the, to begin, the, the, you know, begin the chapter. Why is, why is uh, the Dalai Lama doing this? I mean, why doesn't he just jump into it? Why does he have to, why does he have to establish the old and the new and, and all of this? Uh, because many... Uh, Geluk, for instance, would not consider the Nyingma teaching of Dzogchen to be valid. <coughs> not, e not even valid. Okay. Corrupt. It would be corrupt. So including some of the practices of highest yoga tantra? Well, I'm sorry, I may have misunderstood. The, the reason why he's pointing to the fact that Songba and Kedro speak well of Dzogchen is because many, some Gelukpa scholars nowadays consider Dzogchen to be a corruption. Right. And he has a habit of, well, for instance, when he talked here on the subtle minds that are involved in the process of death, he began with the Four Noble Truths. He places it in a wider context. <clears throat> impermanence, you see, right. impermanence, death, uh, uh, sub well, actually, subtle impermanence, which is the momentary breakup of things, coarse impermanence, which is like death, then within death, this very subtle topic, uh, this is just how he, his mind works. So, you, I mean, the, the chapter is on the mind of clear light within highest yoga time. Absolutely. Okay. It eventually gets there. <laughs> yeah. In Kedru's miscellaneous works, a question is raised about deprecation of the Nyingma doctrine of the great perfection. The questioner wondering if it is a pure doctrine. In answer, Kedru states that deprecation of the old translation doctrine of the great completeness has arisen from the outward behavior of some mantrakas who practice the great completeness. He points out that the great completeness is a practice of high levels of highest yoga mantra, and that in following this view, many have obviously proceeded to high states of adepthood. He adds that Tibetan translators visiting India saw the original manuscripts of the secret essence tantra, the Guya Garba, and so forth in Magadha, and concludes that deprecation of this doctrine would cause rebirth in a bad transmigration. The passage in Kedrup's miscellaneous works reads, so then there's a question.
Well, it's worth reading. The question is, this old, this old translation school of Sikra Mantra was refuted by earlier scholars, and there are also many nowadays who deprecate it. So this is the beginning of the 15th century. How is this? Answer. The translations of the teachings of, the, of Sikra Mantra during the earlier dissemination are called old. Well, that has to be written somewhere. And translations during the later dissemination are called new. The reason for the frequent de deprecation of the old is that during the in interstice, when the teaching faded to King Lang Dharma, due to King Lang Dharma, who lived 803 to 842, ruled for six years, mantrakas engaged in untoward behavior, such as, well, it's called union and release, but this means uh, it ac actually involves ritual murder and so forth. Also, nowadays, there are many householder practitioners with coiled hair in the style of a lay mantraka. Derision of the Nyingma doctrine seems to have risen due to inferences based on these persons' behavior. The actual situation regarding this old translation school of mantra is quite different. Initially, the excellent religious kings sent translators who were reliable beings such as Vairochana and Manyak, the five monks and so forth, with scoops of gold as offerings to India. The very interesting uh, talk that we had earlier in the semester from, what was his name? Just not recalling. Natupsky. Natupsky, Paul Natupsky, which showed that uh, in the, what was it? Seventh, eighth centuries? The Tibetan um, Empire was so great that sending somebody to India didn't mean you were sending them far away. You know, I mean, you had, uh, you had people down there anyway. Uh, you, you were, I mean, it still was a long ways, but you were sending within your own, largely within your own con uh, empire. There they received doctrines of unsurpassed secret mantra, such as the Great Perfection, from persons indisputably renowned as scholars and adepts, and then they translated them. Moreover, Padmasambhava, Vimalamutra, Buddha Guya, and others were invited to Tibet, where they set forth teachings of the profound doctrines belonging to the highest vehicle. It is established by valid cognition that through practicing these systems, an innumerable number were, rele were released from cyclic existence and obstructions and again, and gained adepthood. Also in the monastery of Sanye, this is all a quote from Kedru. There still remain many copies of the Indian texts of the old translation school. And Tibetan translators who went to India reported that Indian editions of the Secret Essence, Tantra, the Five Scriptural Sutras, and so forth exist in Magadha. Therefore, those who deprecate such profound doctrines of the highest great vehicle are only accumulating the causes of rebirth and hell. So, back to the Dalai Lama. <laughs> In this way, Kedrup identifies the great completeness as unique and most profound mode of practicing highest yoga tantra. Therefore, we can indeed conclude that it is a pure doctrine. Many in the four schools of Tibetan Buddhism, Nyingma, Sakya, Kagyu, Gelug, have said that all four have the same basic thought. In the Gelug school, the first mentioned Lama, Losan Chukhi Genzen, 1567 to 1662, states in the root text to his great seal that although the schools use different verbal designations, when an experienced yogi analyzes these, they all come down to the same thought. The first mentioned Lama says, though there are many different designations of names in the systems of innate union, the small case, the fivefold, there's many different systems. Don't ask me what they are. Equal taste, the four letters, pacification, exorcism, jerk, great perfection, instructions on the view of the middle way school, and so forth. When these are analyzed by an experienced yogi, skilled in definitive scriptures and reasoning, they all come down to the same thought. Gongba chiktu pava. So that really is the, going to be the theme of the Dalai Lama's talk. It's still going to take a while to catch it. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, some Gilupa Lamas, such as the third Benjen Lama, 
Lausanne Bene Yeshe, have said that the first bench in Lama had a political purpose in saying so and did not actually hold that the thought of the various schools is basically the same. Their reason for suspecting such is that in Yingma, <coughs> the view of the great perfection is an affirming negative, whereas in Geluk, it is a non-affirming negative. That's their suspicion. Due to which, they feel that there is no way the two could be getting at the same thing. This point has given rise to many disagreements with scholars refuting each other and presenting their own opinions. Within Gogyu and Sagyu and Sagya, there are many explicit refutations pertaining to the great perfection system. And even though in later Geluk works, there are also many in the writings of Tsongkhapa upon which Geluk is based, the terms Nyingma or great perfection are not even mentioned. Those who, did, those who did take objection were refuting specific points as explained by certain persons, but their style can, e but their style can easily give the unfortunate impression that the great perfection is being refuted as a whole, a very sad state of affairs. In my opinion, there is no question that the first bench in Lama meant that all four schools are getting at the same thing. And it is also undeniable that many practitioners have become highly developed yogis based on the Nyingma of Great Perfection teachings. If a yogi can develop fully qualified realization based on a path, then that path is a pure one. Thus, I have given much consideration to how these two presentations could be coming down to the same thing. And although I have formed some ideas on this, I cannot explain them with complete decision and clarity. More analysis is needed. But let me give you my thought. See, this is the end of, near the end of the introduction, <laughs> which is prim primarily based on the work of the Nyingma master, uh, Do Drup Chen, Jingmei Tenbe Nyingma, 1865 to 1926, whose writings are the key for my analysis. So then he, he goes on, um, to lay out just how, where I'm now on page 206, uh, all these, uh, the new school, especially Gelu and Nyingma could all come down to the same basic thought. So let's go on there from next time, uh, really reading it uh, and trying to figure out why he's bringing up this topic and that topic.